All right, everyone. I'm so excited. I have on Sarah Stetna back and she was my midwife for my last couple of births. Um, she was on talking about the midwifery model of care. And I wanted to bring her on to talk about risk a little bit and then some birth center information. Uh, just because I hear so many people um, talking about risk or reaching out to me about like, hey, I have gestational diabetes. So now my OB is saying I have to be induced early. Um, and all these different things. And so um, there's a lot of gray area and there's some black and white. So we're going to dive into it. So I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me again. It's always fun to talk with you. And you just had a baby. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. 10 weeks out. Wow. I would love before we dive in to maybe like since you you how long were you a midwife before you had your daughter um 6 years 6 years and i mean obviously my experience as like a patient of yours like you're super compassionate um very understanding like i think it's interesting when people like would ask me like as a doula before i had kids like you don't have kids so how can you care for people and i'm like did does your ob did he birth a child like <laughs> you know like does he know what the experience is like um, but do you feel like going through your birthing experience that that will change at all, like how you are as a midwife? I think it will change like how and when and where we provide services. Um, not so much, you know, how I support someone in labor. Like, I think that you can learn that without mm -hmm. having given birth. Um, I think experiencing labor land gives me some perspective of what it's like to like you know, connect with someone when they're that vulnerable. Um, but I think it won't change how I, I give care in that moment. But some things that I've been thinking about already is like, how can we um, create a better referral network? How can we create a protocol for families that are dealing with tongue tie? Because that's what I'm going through right now. So there is some like, more nuanced things where I realize, oh, there's a gap here that I didn't realize until I went through it. And now um, let's fill that gap. And so I think it will make me a better midwife, but I don't think you have to give birth to be a, a good midwife or a doula. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you do either. I, I obviously we love you. The <laughs> only reason Vito was like on board with birthing at a birthing center is because you were there. So like, you know, he's like, <laughs> I only trust Sarah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, babe. <laughs> you gotta chill out. Um, but I do think like similar similar with some like doula stuff. I feel like you can see some stuff. But I mean, in our experience going through the birthing center, like the care has always been amazing. And that's one reason why I refer like a lot of people to midwifery care, just because the appointments are so different. Like mm -hmm. when I show up to an appointment, it isn't like, okay, let's check, 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 check. It's like, so what's going on? How are you feeling? What are you doing to prepare for labor? Like anything else going on? You know, like, I feel like, I mean, I've cried at appointments. I'm like, this is what's emotionally happening in my life right now. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like there's time to like, for you guys to hold space for us to like show up and feel like we're being heard. Um, and I think that that is so important because I get messages all the time. Like I just had a friend message me and she's like, she's 38 weeks and her doctor's like, all right, let's schedule your induction. She's like, no, I'm going to go, you know, when the baby's ready. And he's like, well, we just like to get it scheduled because we like to make sure that we have space like for other people coming in. And she's like, so you're scheduling me on account of space, like not for a health reason or not for this. But then there was like, no further conversation. It's like, all right, I got to get to my next appointment. Right. The no uh, further conversation part is, is the catch there. Cause it's like, yeah, you're dealing within a system that you might logistically have to do things like scheduling, like at the right. birth center, we have to do that at 42 weeks for our clients. But if someone said no, like, okay, no, like right. there's a conversation to be had, um, further, but yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's frustrating. Right. Well, and I mean, I've talked on this before, like, I mean, it's not just like an OB's fault. I mean, it goes down to like insurance to how many people they have to see a day to like, there's mm -hmm. so much in there. It's not that they necessarily only want to spend five, 10 minutes with you. That's just kind of how the system's set up. But, um, 
midwifery care is very, very different from pretty much like anybody that you talk to. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I always like to tell people, I'm like, okay, then change providers, find, like, see if you can find a midwife, find somebody else. So um, like in our experience, we've just loved it because that's all we've had is midwifery care. Um, so I don't have much else to explain, like to compare it to, but, um, there, there is definitely like a different level. Um, so one thing I've been getting into lately is just like this last year, I had a client who had gestational diabetes. And so she led me to like research so much more, um, because as soon as she told me that she had gestational diabetes, I'm like, okay, they're going to tell you you have a big baby. They're going to want to induce you early. Here's everything that's going to happen. I sent her all the research because I wanted her to read things for herself. Not that there's not increased risks with things because there are, but you deserve to know the numbers, the actual statistics and make decisions for yourself. Like you're a grown ass woman. You can make these decisions for yourself. And um, all the things that I said were going to happen were presented, but because she had the information, she chose differently. Um, but I was like super interested to find out like gestational diabetes. Yes, there's certain risks attached, but when it's controlled with diet and lifestyle, there's really not an increased risk. And mm-hmm. so it's not treated that way in the hospital system. It's just like a label marked in your folder and then you're completely high risk. So I would love to just kind of talk about risk and how, well, I'll have you take it away because I'm not sure how to yeah. work, like just how risk can affect no. your body even when you're not necessarily high risk. Yeah, I see. Um, so I think to preface everything that we're going to be talking about is it's to make things simple, we will have to generalize, right? Like uh, there is always nuance when we're talking about different types of providers or settings where there are exceptions to the kind of stereotypes or generalizations that we're going to talk about. But as a whole in the U.S., like what you're saying is is so right. Like we have um, a system that puts people into two categories, high risk or low risk. Um, and um, if you have anything that they deem as high risk, which is essentially any risk factor whatsoever, um, potentially, uh, y- you are not received uh, receiving individualized care. So you receive uh, the standard approach regardless of your personal preferences, regardless of your other risk factors or a lack of other risk factors. Um, and part of that problem is because of how the system of healthcare um, works here. And, and that is not a lot of time, uh, a fear of litigation and uh, a lack of really understanding of how physiological birth works. And so um we have a big focus on just managing problems instead of preventing them. Um, we have a big problem with um, deciding for clients instead of including them in decision making. And so those are kind of like the big problems that lead to this trickle down effect of like you're talking about someone is diagnosed with gestational diabetes and they're told they only have this one path of care now, um, regardless of the fact that it's much more nuanced than that. Um, so in midwifery, I think the, the generalization is that the philo- philosophy of care is that birth is normal, uh, pregnancy is normal, and that occasionally complications can develop um, and we want to be able to manage them and treat them. But a majority of the time, these are people who are um, at the youngest, healthiest, point of their lives and um, most of the time doesn't need a lot of intervention um, to happen normally. Um, The other big part of midwifery philosophy is education and prevention. So if you know the best uh, ways to take care of yourself in pregnancy, um, most people are going to do those things if they are aware of them in the first place. So our job is kind of to not only educate and inform people, but then also encourage and validate them along the way um, to keep them healthy and um, prevent some of the complications that we know we we may be able to prevent. Um, alternatively, in majority of obstetrics is, is I'm just going to keep checking on you until you develop a problem. 
because mm -hmm. the assumption is that you will and that birth is something to be managed. Otherwise, you will be unsafe. There will be problems um, if I don't intervene and, and do something, um, I being you know the physician or the care team in general. And so that's kind of like the big pivot. And part of the reason midwifery care emphasizes longer visits is because we know that we need that time, like you said, to actually unpack what is happening in someone's whole life. Um, we need time to educate and we need time to have conversations that include clients in the decision-making process. Um, so there's true informed consent before things are being made. So I love that you said that you're a grown ass woman. Yeah. That's like a mantra I have in my head whenever I'm counseling clients and maybe they make a decision that is different than I would have recommended or that I um, suggest is that, hey, they're grown ass adults. Right. I do not need to make a decision for them. My job as a provider is to make sure they have all the information um, and to support them in whatever decision they make. Now, decisions may have consequences as far as where you can deliver and, and who you can birth with, um, but it's not my job to convince you um, to do something different as long as you have all the information. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of when risk comes into play. So there's lots of different um, things that can go wrong during pregnancy and or during birth. Um, we already talked about how majority of the time that's not the case, but um, let's use your example of gestational diabetes. Um, so in traditional obstetrics, gestational diabetes would be considered a high-risk pregnancy. Um, but in the birth center or in midwifery, that's not always the case. Um, if a client is diagnosed with gestational diabetes, um, the first thing we do is tell them what that means, which seems so simple, but a lot of clients make it to the end of their pregnancy with gestational diabetes, not really understanding what is happening and why is this a problem. So our first step is making sure that they know why this is happening. Um, how to manage it and treat it for the and the potential outcomes if it's not managed. So for gestational diabetes, most people, if they're given proper education and they're young and healthy and don't have other complications, can manage that their blood sugars with diet alone and and uh, exercise. And if you have normal blood sugars, even though you still have gestational diabetes, if you're able to manage a majority of your blood sugars with those two nutrition and exercise, the risk of having gestational diabetes is much lower because the real risk comes with uncontrolled blood sugars. So if you're able to keep your blood sugar in a normal range, then actually that's not a big risk anymore. Um, are there risk factors to be considered? Absolutely. And, and that's part of the conversation, but we don't, um, we try not to label someone as like high risk or low risk in my setting in particular, because someone who um, so for example, say you, uh, you started your pregnancy with a BMI greater than 40. BMI is not a great indicator of health. We know right. that, but we know that it does have some association with risk factors for higher chances of developing things like gestational diabetes or preeclampsia. So that's a conversation we have with someone from the beginning. We say, Hey, this is a risk factor. It does not make you high risk necessarily. Um, it's just a factor that is predictive or potentially predictive that you may be more likely to develop these other complications. So here's what you can do to help lower that risk by doing this, this, and this. Um, and similarly, someone could have had preeclampsia, the previous pregnancy, um, or family members with preeclampsia. We consider that a risk factor, but that alone doesn't make you high risk. There's nothing that says 100% that that is going to happen to you. Um, and there is measures that can be taken to help reduce that risk. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not vigilant and looking for those things. So for example, someone's high risk for preeclampsia, we, we counsel them on all of the ways they can reduce that risk and they can do everything right and still get preeclampsia, right? Um, so that's not the fault of them we, and not the fault of the midwife, right? We, we counseled, we, we did all the things we could and this still develops because that's unfortunately how pregnancy and birth can sometimes unfold is it's out of our control sometimes. So that doesn't mean we don't check someone's blood pressure. Um, it doesn't mean we don't diagnose preeclampsia when it shows up. And when preeclampsia shows up, we say, hey, this is now a higher level tier risk. 
and would be better suited in a more medical setting where you can have closer monitoring, you can have quick access to medications and the OR potentially that could genuinely be life-saving for you um, or your baby. So um, the thing about risk is that it isn't black and white. It is very nuanced. Um, it is very individualized. It takes into account all of the risk factors that are present or not present. And it takes into a client, a client's uh, preferences. Right. So preeclampsia, one of the things we recommend is taking low-dose aspirin. If someone doesn't want to take low-dose aspirin, does that make them higher risk? No, it just means that they decided to opt out of a risk lowering intervention. Um, so it to me, what it comes down to is real conversations about actual evidence and and not this like blanket approach to a simple diagnosis um, because it's it's more complex complex than that. Mm -hmm. There are some some clients that are genuinely high risk and need high risk management with with maternal fetal medicine these are people that have multiple conditions um maybe they have a condition that that um is already present like we talked about like a preeclamptic uh, condition really early in the pregnancy and and the main goal right now is just to keep them healthy and and keep them pregnant um as long as possible um these are very those are much more uh rare situations and um in what you're talking about is is the normal healthy individual who happens to have one risk factor or two risk factors that is now being treated like uh, they are the same kind of complexity as a high risk client that needs induction and intervention and protection, um, essentially. Right, right. Yeah. And that is like what I see a lot. And it's hard because like you want people to have that individualized care and they are just kind of put into this category. And when going back to like, you are a grown ass woman and having somebody mm -hmm. make a different decision than you would. What I have found that is so hard as a doula is that when we've, and, and I'm in this like doula group right now. So somebody was talking about it the other day when we presented so much research and like gone over so much with our clients and they're totally like, yes, I'm not going to get any cervical checks. There's no evidence. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get feared into getting induced. And then I get a text and they're like, oh yeah, I'm one centimeter dilated, da, 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 da. And I'm like, what happened? Like, that's fine. I don't want you to feel like you had no choice. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're scared into it. But the messages that like I've gotten from people is like mind blowing, you know? And, and then being like, okay, well, I'm past 40 weeks now and my provider's telling me that my baby could die. So mm -hmm. what's the choice I'm going to make here? you know, like feel right. responsible for my baby dying or getting induced. And it's like, then I feel like some of that, like I didn't educate properly or I did anything, but it's like, you're a grown person. You can make your own decision, but like also heartbroken that you're feared into something mm -hmm. versus like, if there was a reason to medically induce, like, let's say you had preeclampsia and like your blood pressure is out of control. Like there's reasons to medically induce. But when there's nothing and mm -hmm. they're scared and that's the reason they're not even like, I just want to, I'm over it, whatever. Like, no, they're sure. scared into it. Like motivated by fear. Right. It's like, yeah. So I get so amped, <laughs> like, you know, and it's so hard to hear. Cause it's like, man, like, where can we, like, is there more that I could do or not? Because I feel like they're considered high, almost high risk. They're like, if you go past 40 weeks, all these bad, terrible things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like people are almost even now just put into a risk category based on gestational age or not just right. gest gestational weeks, you know, like, and I, that's like not evidence-based. Right. So I think making making a decision out of fear is just a, a sign that coercion is happening. Right. Um, usually, usually. Um, I mean, obviously there could be someone that's has their own internal fears and everyone else is reassuring them and they're still, you know, 
afraid of that. But if they were confident in their conversation with you and then they go see their provider and they leave completely different plan. I mean, we have a um, we have a culture that's afraid of birth because we don't know a lot about it. And then we also have a culture where authority knows more than us. And um, and so if we are already kind of afraid of this thing that we don't know, and then someone with authority is telling us, yes, you really should be afraid of this. Um, our families are telling us yeah. you should be afraid of this um, or that's not what happened to me or, you know, all of the anecdotes. Um, it is really hard to go against the status quo. And that's what midwifery is. That's what birthing, choosing to birth in a birth center is. That's what choosing to birth without an epidural is. It's it's a going against what the majority of our country does. But if you have a ability to zoom out more, you can see that the status quo is actually impacting our outcomes, right, as a nation. Um, and we know that um, these fears and the interventions to address those fears uh, don't actually make things safer or better. Um, and I, in fact, they're making things worse. Uh, we know that we're the only one of the only developed countries that continues to have a rising um, maternal death rate and infant death rate. Um, despite all of the dollars and technology and interventions that we do, we're, we're not getting any better. And then you look at the micro data of midwifery care in the U.S. and the data is the opposite. We're, we're making things way better. Um, and we're doing things that would technically go against, you know, what, uh, what the standard of care would say is really unsafe or dangerous, but the evidence does not say that. And there's always this gap between what's happening in practice and what the evidence says. And, and that's where it gets, um, it really just all comes down to individualizing to just say like a blanket statement that past 40 weeks is dangerous. Like, no, we, we know that's not true. We we know there are potential like risks. If you take into account other risk factors, right. If you're looking at the fetal well being, if there's other indications that things aren't well, then yes. But like just the weeks alone, <laughs> that's an easy way out. That's a cop out. Um, right. That's not individualizing what this person needs and what they want. Um, I think the frustration is maybe like for me, you can have a policy. Like you could say, okay, we recommend induction after 40 weeks. Sure. Recommend it if you want, if that's, you know, what you feel as a provider. But if a client says, no, don't spend the next five minutes of that visit, scaring them into deciding that because you don't have evidence to back you up on it. And that's not informed consent. That's coercion. And that right. is wrong. Right. Um, I'm in such a bubble in <laughs> in the birth center and in my field because I forget that this is still like such a thing. And it comes so normally because the philosophy is so embedded in me and in, in the midwives that I've worked with that like I forget that like these providers are like are not being malicious. They really are not. Um, they are either also afraid or they don't have the evidence. They just don't know it. Um, and that's on them. And it shouldn't be, you know, put onto the client. But it is just really infuriating that they cannot see the direct correlation between these tactics and bad outcomes. Right, right. Yeah, what's interesting is I had a friend um, this summer who didn't want to get induced, didn't want to get induced. And it was after 40 weeks and her provider was trying to convince her to get induced and was telling her things that are not evidence-based at all. But she was calling the practice because they wanted her to like come the next day to get induced. And she's like, I don't like, what if I don't come tomorrow? Like he's convincing her that it's medically necessary to get induced. She calls the practice. She's supposed to come in the next day. She's like, what if I don't get induced tomorrow? What if I do like Monday? And they're like, oh, well, we don't have appointments Monday. You'd have to wait until Thursday. And she's like, mm -hmm. okay, so it's okay to wait in another week. Like, obviously this isn't medically necessary if you're like, oh, well, we can schedule you. We can squeeze you in like a week from now. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, then that's like not an emergency situation. Um, 
but yeah, like talking about induction for due dates, that's like why I like presenting the information because there are certain risks and some of that, there are different risks factors. And some of that is associated with age and is associated with your health and different things like that. So there's like a really cool chart that evidence-based birth has, and it goes like based off your age, your health and everything Mm -hmm. like that. But the other way that a lot of information is presented is like, you have like, let's say V back. They're like, you have a double chance of your placenta <laughs> rupturing if you have a vaginal birth. Yes. And it's like, okay, it goes from like 0.2 to 0.4%. You know what I mean? It's like, you need the actual numbers. Is 0.4% enough for you? Maybe, maybe not, but that's for you to decide. So it's like the way that the information can be presented. It's like, it's unsafe to have a VBAC, but they don't give you the risks of repeat cesareans along with that. Um, so, and they don't give you the risk that uterine rupture can happen without a prior no cesarean. What. Right. You don't have that conversation with a primip that just so you know, your uterus could rupture. No, because the risk is so minute. Um, and you don't want to terrify people. And it's so unlikely. You're not going to have a conversation. You cannot possibly counsel someone on every single thing that could possibly happen or go wrong during a pregnancy or birth. It's just like unnecessary because most of the time those things don't happen. Similarly, a uterine rupture for VBAC is also minuscule, like so minute. I mean, compared to not having a prior cesarean, yes, it's double the risk, but it's still so small. Um, And it's that conversation is only one-sided because who's, like you said, who's, who's talking about the risk of having a repeat cesarean or what are the risks that come along with an induction? Um, and here are, here are your two choices or your three maybe, and here's all the pros and cons of each of them. And now which one fits best for, for your potential risk threshold as an individual? Mm-hmm. And I will support you in what you choose. Like that takes time and nobody's doing that. Um, well, that's a generalization. <laughs> a lot of people are not doing that. Right. Well, and that's like what's hard. I feel like what sucks though with the birth center is because of like certain laws in place, you guys can't take like VBAC clients right now, you know, like certain things. So Mm -hmm. I I feel like so many people who also want different, it's like also in the state of Illinois, like certain midwives aren't allowed to practice Um, like California, Illinois, a lot of places like midwives are bound by certain things that they can't Mm -hmm. do certain things. And that leaves us so limited on care. So like one of my biggest fears is that I'm going to have a breech baby and I'm going to have zero options. And mm-hmm. that sucks. I'm like, I told Vito, I'm like, okay, well, we're driving to Wisconsin or Indiana. Like mm-hmm. that's it. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that when you feel like, man, how come, like, I, I know the research behind breech. Like I know that vaginal breech isn't that much more risky, but it is if you're with a provider who doesn't know how to do it. Right. Like you don't want to be with a provider who you can't like, for me, I wouldn't feel comfortable just being like, nope, I'm just going to do it no matter what. I would like a skilled provider to be able to like safely deliver my baby. But like, I have no options in Illinois to do that. Like, mm-hmm. and if I do, there's a couple of like OBs that might let you try, but then you have to schedule the induction for the day that they're on call to like, try to do that, you know? So it's like pretty much impossible. And it's like, man, like this sucks that in certain situations we have zero options. Yeah. I mean, there's no, um, if you, if you don't have a choice, then it's, yeah, it, it's irritating <laughs> to say the least, but also it's impacting outcomes and, and health. Right. So yeah, I think um, to your point, like midwives are restricted and, and that's because, you know, who's writing the laws. These are people, the people writing the laws are getting information from our, um, th- they're not looking at the data. <laughs> they're not looking at a research study unless people are bringing you know, our legislators, that information. And we just, you know, after decades of trying, just got certified professional midwives, um, licensure bill passed um, with a lot of conversations around safety. And then we also just got a birth center licensing act passed that um, will allow us to do VBACs. And um, so, and, but it's like, it's taxing because you really have, you have to go against the noise we had um the licensing act for example was open to comment f- to the public and it circulated through a lot of academic centers and and hospitals and providers and the amount of 
I, I will just say like ignorant comments that were made to the legislators um, without any basis for what is safe and evidence-based was just like really insulting as a provider who works at a birth center and like knows that I actively uh, try to be safe and try to be evidence-based and, and and want the best for my clients and, and don't want to try to do anything um, that puts anyone at risk. And to have people who really don't know anything about my profession or anything about birth centers be making like really blatant comments that don't reflect what we know is to be true. Um, and they say it like it's true. Right. And legislators don't know any different unless we're telling them like, wait, no, you need to read this. Like they're wrong. I know you got 500 comments that we shouldn't do VBACs, but like, look at this. And, and that's what convinced them, which is great. And, and, um, and a lot of time and, and negotiations from the Illinois birth center task force and, and a lot of people working very hard to make sure that our voice was heard, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so embedded in like, it's such a cultural thing. Like it's really what it is. It, it's culturally like, this is not normal. And like, like you said, Vito only agreed to come to the birth center because he had a personal like connection right. with me and trusted me. Mm -hmm. um, and we get that a lot. Like we get a lot of clients who their families do not support them in their choice to come to the birth center because it goes against what they think is right or what they think is safe. And it's so hard to like, my job is not to convince you that the birth center is safe. Like I will give you the evidence and research, but I'm not going to coerce you into right. coming here. But like, it really is so hard to have that knowledge. Like you were saying, like to know what the evidence says to know, like, Hey, you actually have a way better chance of having a vaginal delivery. That's like empowering and, and like satisfying here than anywhere else around us. Um, and like, and still have someone be like, well, someone might, you know, might, my mom says the doctor's really the safest thing. It's like, based on what? Right, right. Based on what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, it's really, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but when I became a midwife, I didn't know the hardest part about being a midwife was going to be having to like justify my career for my whole career, basically, um, to, to like convince people of the value that I bring. Um, which is crazy when the research and like evidence shows it. It's like yes, overwhelming. We can show you that for low risk moms, that birthing centers have way better outcomes than hospitals do, or right. like midwifery care has way better outcomes than obstetric care. And mm -hmm. so it's like the research and the evidence is there. But and I've had these conversations with people too, and it like doesn't sink in <laughs> either. Yeah. And I'm like I don't get it. <laughs> I do think that it's changing though, which maybe that's my bubble speaking, but I like websites like evidence-based birth, like putting mm -hmm. the, like the info in a like non-biased, easy to understand way for consumers to learn places like birth guide here in Illinois that really break down all of the different options that people have. Like if you didn't know that the birth center was an option before you gave birth, then that's like a problem. Like if you knew it was an option and you still chose the hospital, great. But like, I want you to at least know you had this option. And if it, if it was right for you, like come to see us. But yeah, so like there are like a lot of more, I think even like Instagram and TikTok have been huge in like educating people. Some yeah. of it's, you know, you know, it's all all things come with like uh, some level of misinformation, but yeah. I can't tell you the amount of like Gen Xers or Gen Zers, sorry, who have come to care with us that have learned about midwifery or like unmedicated birth through these social media platforms and didn't even know it was possible before that. And it's like, okay, if you're not seeing it, you don't know about it. Like, of course, you're going to think the norm is the only option you've ever been presented. But if you get a chance to see what else is out there and then what the data says about it, then maybe this is the right choice for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to just say like one more thing about risk before we um, dive into some more birth center stuff. Mm -hmm. um, just because another thing that brought me to it was um, Dr. Sarah Wickham has some like information on risk too. And she had talked about the BMI and mm -hmm. um, she assessed the research and said that there is often very little or no difference in outcomes between women who have a higher BMI and women with a BMI that is considered normal mm -hmm. um, in midwifery care. 
So in the obstetric care, you have worse outcomes. So I feel like that's like information that people need to know. Like also with the risk factor is if, as long as it's not too risky and you're not risking out of midwifery care, because like you said earlier, that's a different level of care where you might actually like really need medicine, need other resources Mm -hmm. available, but that your risk factor doesn't define you. And what might be is your care provider. Your care provider is the one that is defining you. So if they're like, oh, well, you have a higher BMI, you're automatically high risk. I would seek out midwifery care. I would seek out something else where I'm going to be treated as an individual and I'm going to be treated in different care. And I'm more likely to have a better outcome than in care that's just seeing me as like a bomb waiting to go off and a problem to fix. Yeah, absolutely. And I I feel like um, that that research regarding like BMI, um, and outcomes, it's, it's not hard to make the conclusion that when you are labeled because of BMI, and then you have a slew of interventions that you wouldn't have had otherwise, and then you have a change in outcome, like, you know, you have, we've, we've talked about the cascade effect or the domino effect or however you want to call it, but there's also like something to be said for like, just feeling, um, empowered to to have a normal pregnancy so like when a client comes to the birth center and we we at their first visit we acknowledge like hey this is a risk factor here's the recommendations that we usually uh you know offer or suggest um but then we we go about their care normally we don't bring it up at every single visit we don't like invoke this fear in them at every chance that we we get we we treat them like a normal client because they are and and also I think there's something to be said for like um we just guilt moms in every way possible um even before their babies are here and we make an assumption in our culture that they don't know how to take care of them and um their themselves or their baby um and we guilt them for every decision they make (laughs) and that's like very draining um mentally emotionally uh psychologically and i feel like that has to impact us um and and the health of our pregnancies Mm -hmm. but when you go into an environment where you're getting like lifted up and you're being like championed for and in the the benefit of the doubt or the assumption is that you are making the best choices for you um i think that makes a really big impact maybe it's not a tangible thing that you can study but i do think it it leads to healthier parents. Yeah, it does. It does for sure. I'm linking some of that research in the show notes too, just so people can like read it for themselves. Um, cause we're big fans of that. It's not like, don't take our words for it. Like Mm -hmm. look at the research, make your own decision. One other caveat about Mm -hmm. evidence. We Mm -hmm. talked a lot about evidence. We are clearly like really evidence on our side so we can really like lift it up. But I do want to say that there is something to be said for things that we don't have evidence on. Um, And we won't all like pregnancy is really hard to study. Birth is really hard to study. We won't always have a clear cut answer of what is right or safe or the best option. And evidence is always changing. Um, There's a lot of traditional midwifery practices that cannot be um, or have not been studied um, and that are dismissed because they don't have evidence. Right. Um, And I just want to nuance I guess the nuance of the fact that if a what supersedes evidence for me is informed consent. Right. Yeah. So even though I might have all the evidence to say like this thing is the right choice, like active management or, you know, low dose aspirin or something like that, where it is kind of like an intervention, but like the evidence is really supportive. If a client like still doesn't want it or has their own beliefs or thoughts or you know preferences my job is really just to make sure they have the information and then support them in whatever choice they make and and that includes things that don't always have evidence to back them up or when clients go against what the evidence says so it's just like all about choice like you said like people should have options and they shouldn't be told what to what to do Mm -hmm. right yeah Right. Exactly. Um, talking about like stressful appointments. I have a couple of friends who are like pregnant. We're like within a couple weeks of each other. And every single week I get a text from one of my friends, like after her appointment, she's so pissed off because she did mid- midwifery care with her last two. And for mm. some reason she didn't this time. 
And her last text was like, it was the guy who was like, we're going to schedule you because we need space in the hospital. And she's mm-hmm. like, I'm just like feeling so like stressed out every single time I go in and, you know, like just dreading your appointments and that sucks. Right. And- Even if you know, you can decline something or something, if it's going to be a fight or every time you go, you're dreading. It, right. That's yeah. right. I know it's, it's very taxing and draining and you don't want to feel that way, you know, mm-hmm. at your birth either so but she's like very she knows what she wants she's pretty like firm but I just like get that text from her like every week you know and I'm like oh that sucks like you definitely don't want to feel that way like you just want to feel like again like even if you're suggesting something different that it's like okay well birth preference has like a lot to do with birth satisfaction and whether it's an empowering because even if I choose to make a different choice and maybe it didn't go as well, or it wasn't what you recommended. Like that was still then my choice. I had the power in my birth, you know, and that's, that's empowering. So, um, that is really important. I do want to talk about like the birth center though, because like how people like one comment, like when I refer people to the birth center, Mm -hmm. the biggest setback that I get is like, but they, can you get an epidural there? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, no, (laughs) but I think as a culture, we also just kind of view discomfort and pain as bad when they are a part of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we, and we live in a society that like needs to fix pain. So like, as soon as our kids are sick, we don't want them to be uncomfortable. We don't whatever, but being uncomfortable is also part of like getting better, you know, like mm-hmm. getting over it. And so, um, I think we just kind of have, we're scared of birth. Mm-hmm. We're scared of pain. And, um, that's like the biggest, like when I'm like, well, you should check out the birth center. They're like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, I don't know if I can do it. So um, I'd love to kind of talk about that a little bit and maybe what options are there, other ways to help with pain relief in birth. When someone tells me that they don't think they can do it without an epidural, I usually tell them, yes, you can. It's okay if you don't want to though. <laughs> like, True. like, so uh, the idea that you like, oh, I, I have a low pain tolerance or, or like, this is, I, I could never like, don't already like tell yourself you can't <laughs> essentially. Like yeah. if you want to, you can. Um, and we do have a lot of options. I mean, we have, um, the clients who choose birth center care are not just like some super human people who can somehow tolerate pain better than everyone else. Like they are just normal people who want to give birth um, in a setting that's outside of a hospital. And usually um, one of the tricks that like you'll see in like doula classes or like birth classes sometimes is like they'll have you hold like an ice cube. Have you ever heard of that one? Mm Mm-hmm. So they'll just like do a round where you hold an ice cube in your hand and and they'll time you and like, you just do it and it's uncomfortable and like really cold and and then you let go. Right. And then they do it again. And this time you have your friend or your partner or whoever, like in, egging you on, like hyping you up. Like, yes, you can do this. Just like t- t- 10 more seconds. You got it. You got it. You got it. And you can do it way longer. You can hold an ice cube way longer um, when you have everyone around you supporting you. So that is like the simplest uh, explanation of why people can have unmedicated birth um, easier in a home or birth center setting. Um, because there's lots of people who go into a hospital setting planning to have an unmedicated birth um, and and have higher rates of epidurals than, you know, home and, and birth centers who and I think it's because you don't have that hype team around you who is used to seeing unmedicated birth. So when you have a team that knows what unmedicated birth looks like and they're not trying to fix it for you, right? Like we're not, we're not, um, we're not afraid of, of your pain reaction. Like if you are moaning and you are, um, you have a moment of crying, you know, we're not, you know, you can get epidural. We can go, we can go right now. You can go get epidural. We're saying like, you got this, you can do this. Look how strong you are. Um, let's try this. Let's do this. That doesn't mean as soon as you say you want to pivot, we're not going to pivot, of course, but we're not trying to give you um, 
the exit door. And instead, we're telling you, like, everything that you're feeling is normal. You know, everything that is happening right now, here's why you're feeling these things. Your baby's moving down. Your cervix is opening. You know, whatever it is. Um, giving some context to knowledge is power and it, and it helps erase fear. Um, so, obviously, one of the key ways that we support people in unmedicated birth is um, by requiring childbirth ed. And that's part of it is like, if you know what your body's going to go through, it's less scary with, when it's happening. Um, you remember learning about the ring of fire. Or you remember learning about these things. It doesn't make it any less intense, of course, but there's like some wherewithal of like knowing like, oh yeah, this is normal. I remember this. I remember that this was something that was going to happen. And then alternatively, we have, and epidural is not the only way to get comfort, right? Um, so we call it the liquid epidural, which is the tub. Um, you'll see most birth center photos like out there, the clients have their baby, they're holding their baby in the water in the tub. And that's because most people who birth in a birth center end up in water. Um, they don't all deliver in the tub, but a lot, like, I think our rate at our birth center is like over 90% of our clients get in the tub. And that's because labor is intense and it is uncomfortable. Um, and water relaxes smooth muscle. It calms most people. And when you are calm and your muscles are relaxed, your pain threshold or your pain perception decreases and it becomes more manageable. Um, there's also something to be said, like physiologically about, you know, pain, versus discomfort, versus pressure. There's lots of different sensations in our body and we've never experienced those sensations until labor, those specific ones. Um, but I think there's a big difference between like pathological pain, like, hey, I broke my leg yeah. versus physiological pain, which is, hey, my body is opening and making space for this baby to come out. Um, and birth is one of the only times that like intense discomfort um, is associated with joy right or associated with like something that is not wrong mm -hmm. um and so normally it's our body's way of telling us like hey something's really wrong but in labor it's just saying like hey you better be with your birth team because the baby's coming um so uh one i think education two the tub is a great resource and then of course um we've got things like nitrous just to kind of help with relaxation. So nitrous, um, for those who aren't uh, familiar with it, is this nitrous oxide. It's a gas that you would maybe find at a dentist. Um, it's short acting. It, it's uh, inhalation. So you put a mask on, you take a deep breath in during the peak of the contraction, and then you breathe out between contractions and it's already out of your system in between contractions. So it's really just for during the contraction. But what it does is it kind of helps you uh, again, just relax. Anything that's not the the uterus contraction, contracting is kind of softened. And when everything is relaxed, your body can work more efficiently. It's when we're kind of bracing against that pain, like contracting everything around us that um, it can sometimes make pain feel more intense because um, it's just tightened. So when we're able to breathe through it, or we're able to soften everything else and just kind of let the uterus do what it's doing, it becomes much more manageable. So that's what the tub does. That's what nitrous does. Um, massage does that as well. Most of the techniques that midwives or doulas use kind of tap into that concept of like, how can we relax everything else? Um, and it's okay if you can't relax during a contraction, but how can we kind of relax you right after how can you get back into that like really you know parasympathetic like zend out space in between waves um that calm non-fear based place um and that's what we're really good at at a birth center is yeah. helping people tap into that really quickly and it's um i think the other misconception that i hear from clients all the time even after their birth um is they don't think that they were strong because of how hard it felt or like how challenging it is. Yeah. Uh, even in the throes of it, they, they think like, Oh, I, you know, and it's like, everybody feels this way in this moment. Um, everybody has this, um, 
there, there's no going through it. Like you see the, I guess, I guess there is some going through it. Like you see some videos on Instagram or something where like, they're like laughing or smiling their baby out. Like that is, that is rare. I'd say most people like <laughs> it is deep work yeah. and it is, um, but it's not, um, if there's not fear, like it's a little bit, it's just different. I don't know how to explain it. Like there's a difference between someone suffering um, and someone who's just navigating a challenging physical demand on their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I like relate my first and my second labor. I feel like in my first labor, I suffered a lot. And in my second one, I learned how to surrender like through it. And I mean, you were at both <laughs> and I got an epidural with the first one. And I feel like I also had to like navigate that for myself, but that was like such a different experience than my second and everybody's experience like is so different. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember before my second listening to orgasmic birth, listening to it on <laughs> audiobook, and like, you do hear those things. And I'm like, I'm not going to be one of those people that like tell someone that they could have a pain-free birth because like, mm -mm. Even after I had my second, I mean, yeah, I was like, I'm never doing this again. Like, this was so like crazy. But then like two days later, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, you know, you get that birth high, but it was, I mean, it was so intense. Um, and I think it's good to have options in birth. And I feel like sometimes in a hospital setting, you don't feel like you have any or that mm -hmm. you only have like, it's either an epidural or nothing. Yeah, um, where it's like movement and um, other things can be so hydrotherapy, like can be so, so beneficial. Like I always mm -hmm. tell people, like if they don't have the tub, like get in the shower, like most places yeah. have showers, bring a birth ball in there. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to feel like you have zero options, but you can always find them like where you're birthing, but having a supportive team is like the number one key to having a birth that you're envisioning. I feel like, because if you have a providers or a team who's like not supportive, it's that much harder to like, to get it done. So, um, well, and even, I feel like that's true. Even when your birth unfolds in a way that you, that you don't want having that supportive team makes all the difference too. Right. Like, so for example, um, I haven't shared my birth story yet, but my birth was very long <laughs> and very hard. And like you said, I, you know, it unfolded in a way that I wouldn't have wished on anybody. But looking back, I made every decision. Right. I felt held and supported by every single person in my entire team. And their the outcome, you know, someone could say, oh, that's like you had a traumatic birth. It's like, no, there was actually no trauma. Did it unfold? And was it disappointing? Absolutely. Um, and that's how birth is sometimes. But um, the way I felt and I was treated throughout that entire experience made all the difference. And I think that's the the thing that I try to hold on to as a midwife yeah. is, is I cannot, I cannot ensure that my clients have a certain outcome, right? right. I, I can show up for them when they need it. I support them in all the ways that they prefer. I can actually physically do the things that I need to intervene to keep them safe and keep their baby safe in the event of a complication. But I can't prevent every potential outcome, but I can make sure that they felt listened to and validated and supported. Um, and they come out of that experience feeling respected. Um, so yeah, that's, that's key. Right. Right. And I say that about my first experience too, because it obviously like didn't go as I planned either, but I'm like, I felt like so supported, like mm -hmm. throughout it. I remember even like my first time asking for an epidural and I was like, no, no, I'm going to keep going. And I went like five or seven more hours, like somewhere. I remember in that. And, and then I decided to get one, you know, and, and just even feeling supported, like, okay, are you sure? Like, do you want to try a couple more things? And I'm like, no, I'm done. And then you're like, okay, all right, let's call anesthesia. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like, and also like, I felt empowered because I also knew like the information around it. I knew like risks and benefits and like, whatever, you know, I know that when you're in the moment, it's like sometimes hard to make a rational decision. Like definitely when you feel like you're dying, but, <laughs> but like, you know, I felt like 
just so, so supported throughout. I'm like, my doula had me in every single position, like throughout the room, like there, even though like I fought her on a lot of, them. <laughs> <laughs> even though she's like, you have to try to put your leg up during this contraction. Then the contraction would come. I'm like, nope, nope. My leg's back down. I can't do it. Um, you know, I just felt like so held and supported by you and Karishma and Vito. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so even though it didn't unfold as planned, like that's where you do feel empowered. Like, holding on to that being like, well, I know I wasn't like coerced into anything. I wasn't guilted. I had nobody coming in being like, you don't need to be a superhero, honey. Just get the epidural. You right. know, like I didn't have anybody giving me those comments. Like nobody even brought up an epidural until I did. I'm the right. only one who brought it up, you know, like nobody else did. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, I just, I feel like that it does make like such a huge difference. And even for my second birth, like feeling like you guys trusted me and my body, like when you get to the hospital, they're like, well, we have to check you mm -hmm. in order to admit you. Yeah. And it's like, well, obviously I showed up in active labor, like at the birth center, like I didn't get any cervical exams in my pregnancy or in my birth. And that's like how I wanted it. But it wasn't like, I didn't feel like anybody questioned me on anything. And you know, I get in my head. I was like, let's not go to the birth center yet. I don't want to waste people's time. <laughs> and Beatles like, Liz, stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, like, let's go. Obviously we went at a good time, but like, um, you know, it's, it's hard when, when you do have providers who are questioning you and questioning, like not even believing you. And you hear those stories all the time too. Like mm -hmm. I was at the hospital and I was telling somebody I had to push and they're like, Oh no, honey, I just checked you. You don't have to push. And they're like, no, I need to push. And they're like, not believed. And it's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> you know? So like just having a team is to me, that's like what I always preach. Like I'm really big on making birth plans just because like, that's going to help you find if you do it diligently, taking a childbirth education course, making a birth plan, like reading actual research. And that's what you base your team on, like mm -hmm. going to your team and being like, okay, like, so how do you feel about inductions? And they're like, oh, I don't let anyone go past 40. And it's like, okay, well, that's not like evidence-based. So then you find a new team, you know, like it's, I don't know. I always tell people to change providers all the time. That's an under, um, underutilized strategy as yeah. changing providers. And it is, sometimes it can be really hard to, to change a provider in the third trimester because that's usually okay. when these conversations start. So it's almost like, you know, the sooner you can start reading those books or taking classes, the better, right. because then you, you know, but I'd say most midwifery practices are used to our late transfers because most people are finding out about us after they're starting to dive into research. Like they haven't thought about a midwife until they're like halfway through their pregnancy or like hear a friend talk about it or something. So um, most midwifery practices are known for kind of taking those late transfers, but I would say like, you know, it's never too late to try. Um yeah. Not until the baby's out at least. So we take a lot of late transfers and um, yeah, it's worth being excited to go to your visits. It's worth being like excited to go to your birth. My favorite comment that I get from clients is like in the, their first trimester, right? They're like really nervous about coming to the birth center. They like really, they want to, but they're like nervous about how they're going to manage, you know, the pain. And then they have lots of care with us. They have their education. And then like, we're at their 36 week visit and they're like, I am so excited for labor. And I'm like, what? That's awesome. Yeah. Like, that's where, that's where we want you to be at. Like, be looking forward to this experience. Um, I know, like you said, it's hard, but like, I, I personally, like, I just felt so curious. I was like, yeah. I've witnessed so many births and I'm just like so curious about what this will, will feel like. And um, yeah. And I feel like when you approach it that way, rather than like, oh my God, I'm so scared of this. Um, and that takes work, you know, and, and education and time, but going into it with curiosity and excitement is like such a perfect like starting point for labor. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and going into that, like, I feel like, yeah, it comes off of a lot of like what your care is. Oh yeah. Throughout. So yeah, that's really good advice. But also like the transfers, um, there, I feel like there has been a higher demand in midwifery care. I think, you know, the tick has like risen. I think mm -hmm. during COVID people were looking for out of hospital options. People were scared to go to the hospital. 
Um, yeah. And people started doing a lot of their own research. So transferring late is harder in some places because places are full or midwives are full. Um, so I do like, obviously try to transfer. Like if you're in a place where like, wow, I'd really love to do midwifery care. Like I would absolutely. But if you get this information early, like start taking those questions to your provider early, start developing your birth plan early, take a class early and, and do your research that way as soon as you can, because that's like, then you, also you're not putting that stress on yourself, like later in pregnancy, trying to get in. Cause that was also my other thing with like a breech birth. I'm like, how likely is it that at 37 weeks, I'm going to be able to transfer to one of right. these providers that delivers breach? Probably not because they're packed, you know, because right. they're like the only ones that do that or whatever. So it's like, you need to find providers like that, you know, are on board from the beginning. Right. And align with your philosophy. So um, they might appease you in saying yes to some of the things that you ask early on. Um, but if they're not giving you the impression that they really think about birth in the same way that you do or or in the ways that you want to be supported then like just find someone new um it's not worth trying to like fight and battle someone when you're 38 weeks pregnant and like crying at every you know commercial and like every moment now you got to go like argue with someone in authority um so yeah just if they don't align with your philosophy find someone new who does and is excited to give you the care that you want. Um, yeah, I, I hear a lot of clients like that are afraid to um, make their provider upset mm -hmm. or like, I really like them as a person. Like they're really nice. That's great. They can be really nice and not give you the kind of like care that you are looking for. So it's all about what you are looking for and then just find them. They don't owe you anything. Um, or I guess you don't owe them anything. Um, so if you want to find someone else, just do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Exactly. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about like birth center care before we wrap up? Um, I think the biggest thing that comes up is just like the safety component, which we've alluded to the, the research is really, um, solid that birth center birth is completely safe. Um, we have everything, um, that you would need in, 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 uh, complication. So like postpartum hemorrhage, we can treat that, um, a baby who needs a little help breathing after they're born we can do neonatal resuscitation. Our team drills and practices that more than I ever did in a hospital setting as a nurse or a midwife in a hospital setting. So I probably am way better at it now than I was when I was in the hospital setting. Um, and then similarly, we have really good relationships in place with our um, EMS and hospital teams. So when that level of acuity changes and we do need um, support from the, the hospital and um, and or interventions that we can't provide, we have a streamlined process to get our clients to that care. Um, the percentage of emergencies that require transfer is like less, it's like 2% or mm -hmm. less. Um, most of our transfers are for non-urgent um, situations right. that just need monitoring or for requests for epidural or things like that. Right. Um, so yeah, birth is safe regardless of the setting that you're in but it seems to be uh safer uh when you're in a place that actually recognizes birth as normal like home or, or birth centers yeah yeah and I do see like a shift moving that way which is really cool because it is gonna like also force other providers to like accept that and practice that way if if that's like the way that everybody's going I feel like it's definitely going to be like slow but mm -hmm. I can see that. I don't know if I'm just like surrounded in the birth world. So I'm surrounded by people who see that, but it does seem to be growing. I think it is um, as well. It's changed a lot since I became a nurse, even in like what, 2012. Um, so like, you know, 11 years ago, there's been a, a bigger like acceptance of the model of care, um, at least locally. Uh, definitely a challenge in, in the rest of the country in certain places, but in Illinois, I feel like we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and energy today. I know that you have a little baby at home <laughs> uh, and it's a weekend and you have your husband. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and to have this conversation. Um, obviously you're passionate about it. It's something like I'm very passionate about. I feel like I've pivoted in like how I see things a lot since becoming a doula. Um, mm-hmm. Even like just in my initial training, like being taught that like we're not allowed to advocate and we're not allowed to like do certain things. And I'm like, but I have to, you know, like, and me trying to navigate what would that even look like and trying to figure out like what my role is then. Um, but just like learning yeah. and educating mm-hmm. and trying to you like, should, um, you should do a podcast on maybe you have already, but that alludes to like obstetric violence and like witnessing that and what the role of like a doula is or a nurse in in witnessing something like that or helping, um, you know, be an ally when that's occurring. And, uh, there's a lot, uh, that needs to be talked about in that regard. And it happens in all settings, but it's very prevalent in the hospital setting. I was a witness to it for many, many years as a nurse. Um, there's a lot of secondary trauma there too. And, and it can be really hard as a, as a doula to like be told or trained that like, oh, you just need to like, let your client speak. You don't speak for them. And that's true to some degree, but if you are witnessing violence, like right, you need to say something or you need to protect your client who's vulnerable and in labor. Totally. Yeah. That would be a good episode. I haven't really talked about it. I've shared like a couple bursts that I've been at and I've like left crying and like, mm. you know, just feeling like what the heck. So, um, but yeah, that would be a good episode for sure. Um, I'll have to do that, but again, yes. Thank you so much for coming on for your time, energy, and wisdom here today. Thanks Liz.